I want to do an example of using Newton's laws to analyze the motion of a sled sliding down a slope. In particular, this is a slope made of frictionless snow, handy stuff to have around, and the sled starts 10 meters away from the trunk of a very firm, hard, dangerous tree. Fortunately, uh, the sled is dropped, there's no one in it, and the sled's going to slide down and finally slam into the trunk of the tree. And my question is, if the slope that the sled is on is 10 degrees above horizontal, this may not be to scale, if it's 10 degrees above horizontal, how fast will the sled be going right before it slams into the tree? That's the question we want to ask. And to analyze this, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to go through um, our standard problem-solving strategy for force problems. You can use this way of thinking about problems for just about any force problem ever. This one's relatively straightforward. There aren't that many pieces going on, but even if you have multiple objects interacting, you can use this strategy multiple times to bring it all together and understand how they work. So here's what we're going to do. Our, our problem-solving strategy looks something like this. Step one in our first problem-solving strategy is always going to be to identify the forces on our choice of system. For this particular example, for this scenario, it's pretty clear that the system we care about is the sled. And so to identify the forces, the way that I always do this, uh, first, uh, I guess I, I always draw a picture. Always draw a picture. It's really helpful to draw a picture. And uh, the other thing I do, I will draw a dotted line around the system of interest, a dotted line around the sled to separate my choice of system from the environment. I've drawn that dotted line, now I've separated the sled from everything else in the universe except for the sled. That's my choice of system, and the dotted line helps me visualize that. Step Once I've done that, to identify the forces, what I can do is be very systematic. I look at every place where the outside world touches the system. So looking at this, there's a contact point, well contact surface really, between the sled and the snow. A little, I'll draw a single dot, even though it's a, a whole surface con in contact. I'll draw that dot. Uh, if I really wanted to be picky, I could show air hitting the sled from in front. If I want to keep track of air resistance, I'm going to be lazy and not worry about air resistance right now. Um, other things, so that, that's the only point of contact between the sled and something else. The owner has dropped it already. So, okay, I've got that. I've done this. Now for each one of those contact points that I identified, I list the types of forces that happen there. Anytime I have two surfaces in contact, I always want to include a normal force at that point. Normal, as you've probably learned, normal doesn't mean typical like it does in ordinary language. When a physicist talks about a normal force, we're talking about the mathematical sense of the word normal, which means perpendicular to a surface. So a normal force is a force perpendicular to the surface of this, of this uh, tilted uh, sheet of snow that the sled is going down. I'm going to name that force, and I'm going to go ahead and assign a symbol to it. I'll use F sub n. Other people use just a lowercase n. Other, whatever symbol works for you, I'm fine with that. F sub n is what our current textbook is using, so I'll run with it. So normal force, F sub n. In general, any time I have a normal force in a problem, I also list a friction force. Because every normal force in, can produce a friction force. But here, and friction would usually be written with a little f vector. That's the traditional form of a friction vector. But for us, it says frictionless snow, so we get to ignore that. Unless it says frictionless, assume there's friction if there's a normal force. Normal force comes with friction. Friction will always come with a normal force. Okay, got that. That's the only contact point if we're ignoring air resistance. So the other thing we can do is we can look at long-range forces. What are some of the long-range forces that could exist in the universe? Well, elect electric attraction and repulsion, magnetic forces are long-range forces, but most important for us, gravity is a long-range force. And gravity, and again, different sources do this differently. The textbook I'm using now calls this the force of gravity. Fg, 
Some textbooks will call this, will refer to this force as weight, W. But whatever you want to use, you can call it Bob if you want to, as long as you define it somewhere. And we've got our normal force, we've got gravity. That's our complete list of forces. We've gone to every point where there's a contact, we've listed the contact forces there, and then we've looked at the long range forces. This is all we've got. All right, so I've done that. That was step one, to identify the forces. Step two is always to draw the free body diagram of the system. And as usual, physicists call this FBD because we write down free body diagrams so often that an abbreviation is worthwhile. The free body diagram, remember how this works. For a free body diagram, I take the list of forces I have, I represent my system, the sled, as a single point, and then I go through my list of forces and I draw up the direction for each one. So the normal force, we said earlier, that points normal to the surface, perpendicular to the surface. That means it's tilted, again, not the scale. There's my normal force, that's supposed to be an N really. There's my normal force vector, and my gravitational force, by definition, points straight down. In my picture, this will do nicely. That's my gravitational force. And those are my two forces, so that's my free body diagram. That's the core of the free body diagram anyway. The other things that I always like to include with a free body diagram are, first, I like to draw an arrow, or I often represent it as a double arrow, next to the diagram representing acceleration, the direction of acceleration, which is also the net force vector. Again, different sources label this in different ways. But looking at this, which way is our sled going to accelerate? Here's the deal. I know that it's in contact with the surface, so unless something really weird is happening, it's not going to go flying off into the distance or something, or burrowing down into the snow. Unless, if, if things work the way I expect them to, the sled is going to move along the surface. That's true any time you have a normal force in your problem, as long as the surface itself isn't moving. You don't have like the earth, the ground billowing up beneath this or something. As long as the surface is held steady, the normal, then the motion of the object is going to be along the surface. And pretty clearly to me, it's going to be down the hill, not up the hill for the acceleration. So I'll go ahead and draw in my acceleration vector down the hill. There we go, that's my acceleration vector. And I draw that, I think of that as part of my free body diagram, or at least an important accessory to it. Maybe it's, it's some bling or something for my free body diagram. We've got that, okay? Um, uh, the other thing to notice, by the way, is that we couldn't have had acceleration zero for this because these two, there are only two vectors, two vector forces, and they're not opposite each other, so there's no way they could have canceled out. So we know there's going to be some leftover acceleration somewhere, and we know it's going to be down the slope. Okay, finally, the last part of, choose, of drawing a free body diagram that I always do as part of this free body, free body diagram process is I choose coordinates to use to describe this diagram. And for choosing coordinates, I have two priorities. Priority number one is line up the coordinates. But we have, I mean, we've got a standard set, right? We often say x is this way, y is this way, and that's our standard xy coordinate system. But in physics, we're going to find it's often very advantageous to tilt our coordinates one way or another so they line up with this problem. In particular, I want to line up my coordinates so that one axis or the other lines up with the acceleration. That's my top priority. It's, as we've seen before, it's, very, it's much easier to keep, track, to keep track of acceleration if it's on one of your equations, one of your coordinates, and not the other. So you have one constant acceleration and one constant velocity equation. If we had some mixture, any coordinate system is correct. But we want, if we want the most efficient one, we want to line up with acceleration. If you don't have an acceleration vector, you don't know what it is, a second guess, a good second choice, is to line up with a normal force or any other unknown force in the system so that, that unknown is only along one direction. In this case, my acceleration is this way. I'm going to choose coordinates so that I'm lined up x with the acceleration vector and y with the normal force. I suppose if I were really clever, I might have actually pointed x down the hill, but apparently I didn't do that just now, so I'll leave it the way I drew it. Okay. So I've got my free body diagram. This, to me, is a complete free body diagram with all the forces, with the acceleration vector off to the side, which, remember, 
doubles as the net force vector. You can think of it as either one. That is the same direction because of Newton's second law. And we've got the coordinate system. That's step two in our process. Step three in our force problem solving strategy, step three is the one that, it, on some level, it's the most important one. It's the one that we have been leading up to this whole time. The whole point of listing forces was to draw the free body diagram. And the full, whole point of drawing the free body diagram what is to apply Newton's second law to the problem. And uh, that I'm going to put in a little fluffy, fluffy uh, cloud because it is so important. Every time you draw a free body diagram, the reason you did that was so that you can write down Newton's second law. In particular, write down Newton's second law in components or more or less equivalently in unit vector form. Unit vector form. If you're going to write it down that way, that's the whole point of free body diagrams and choosing coordinates is to be able to do this. So let's see how that works. Newton's second law, there are different ways of writing it. Uh, sometimes I have written it as, I'm going to get rid of this abbreviation, it's in my way. Sometimes I've written Newton's second law as acceleration vector equals 1 over the mass times F net vector. Other times, you'll see it, and more commonly I guess, you'll see it as F net equals mass times acceleration, force equals mass times acceleration. That's Newton's second law in vector form. And the great thing about this is that we get two equations for the price of one here. Let's look up here. We, we, remember, we get an x equation and a y equation for this. So I'm going to go ahead and write this down. I'm going to say that ax equals 1 over mass times the x component of the net force. And I can write down that ay equals 1 over mass times the y component of the net force. And it turns out I know what the net force is. Um, let me clear this out of the way just to point out, this is 1 over mass times the net force is just the sum of these things. It's the sum of the normal force vector plus the gravitational force vector, or n and w if you do it that way. It's the sum of those two vectors. And so, again, I can do this without even thinking about what the problem is, without, apart from knowing this list of forces. I can say my ax is going to be 1 over m times the x component of normal force plus the x component of gravitational force. I haven't even thought about which way those point or anything. I can just write it down. Similarly, this is 1 over m times the y component of normal force plus the y component of gravitational force. So I've done this. I've written down Newton's second law sort of in, in components, but not with any details in there. Now is the part where I have to actually use my physics knowledge, my free body diagram, to fill in those details. Here's how we do it. I've chosen coordinates. The easiest way I've found to do this is to lightly dot in my coordinate axes through the dot at uh, the center of my free body diagram. There we have the coordinate axes dotted in. Now, they're tilted. You need to figure out how to deal with the tilt here. There are a couple ways to do it. One way, it, you, because the point is, we have the normal force along the y direction. We know we can read off directly from there what the components are. But the gravitational force is at some funny angle. I need to know what that angle is. So here's what I do. I know that the coordinates here are defined relative to horizontal, right? This angle is my angle theta, the 10 degree angle of my slope. That's just sort of copied over from the picture. That's where I have it, so I copy that angle over. There are a couple ways I can identify useful angles for my gravitational force vector here. One of them is to just do a very visual thing to say, okay, I've got x and y. They started off like this, and I tilted my coordinates by 10 degrees. And so that tells me, my angle theta, that tells me that this angle down here must also be angle theta. If you just picture what had to happen to turn down and right into angle on angle, 
the whole thing just tilted from this to this. Of course, they tilted by the same amount. That's the visual way to do it. Another way that I've seen work for some people is being very mathy. I know that this is a right angle. This, the, the, my x and y, my tilted x and y, are a 90 degree angle. So that tells me that this angle right here must be 90 degrees minus theta. But I also now know that horizontal and vertical are a 90 degree angle. So this angle must be 90 minus 90 minus theta, which is just theta. So you can also work through it that way by labeling each individual angle along the way as you go around. This is good enough for me. This, this is, either one of those will get me to know the theta I need down here. Finally, I know it's getting a little cluttered here, I apologize. Finally, I want this force of gravity vector to be the hypotenuse of some right triangle. I know that angle theta that's labeled there should be inside the right triangle, so I know something about it, so I can use trigonometry on the triangle. So what I've done, you can see, naturally, one of my coordinate axes went through the tail of the force of gravity vector. To make a right triangle that fits for this, these coordinates, I don't want to draw a horizontal line here because that wouldn't be the hypotenuse. I want to draw something parallel to the x-axis. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to come down to where the tip of force gravity is, that vector, and I'm going to draw a line parallel to x, like so. Parallel to x, or at least try to. This is suddenly a right angle. That is a right triangle now that I have with the force of gravity as the hypotenuse. Again, I naturally had the y-axis going through the tail of my vector. I just drew a line parallel to x through the tip of my vector, and that built me a right triangle that matched my tilted coordinates. So what's that mean? That means that this side over here is f sub x of gravity, and this side over here is f sub y of gravity the x and the y components of the force of gravity. Cool, I've got those, so what am I going to do? I've got, I, I, I know those are, that means I can figure out from this picture what those look like, or what these different components are. So in particular, let me just jot it down. Uh, the normal force, x component, is zero, because it's purely in the y direction. The normal force, y component, is, I'll just call it fn, with no vector sign or anything. The magnitude, the full magnitude of the normal force is in the plus y direction. The gravitational force, oh, that's not what I meant to do, there's supposed to be an x in there. The gravitational force x component is, well that's here. First of all, I notice in my, it's in my negative x direction. So it's negative, and then uh, this is opposite the angle that I have labeled opposite my theta. So that's the sign, I know the sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. That means this is minus strength of the force of gravity times the sine of theta, or in other words, minus mg sine of theta. Notice the minus sign is here inside the component equation. There was not a minus sign down here, because this is just writing down adding the components. So this is a mindless step. This is where the interesting part comes. Similarly, the y component of the force of gravity in my tilted coordinates. This is in the minus y direction, so it's minus magnitude of force of gravity times, that's the adjacent side to the angle, cosine is adjacent of our hypotenuse, so force of gravity times cosine of theta, or minus mg cosine of theta. I now have all four of those components written down, um, and I can put them into my two component equations. Again, I could be doing all this with unit vector form as a single vector equation without splitting it into separate equations. That's actually the way I kind of like to do it when I'm doing things on my own notes. But I found that for most students in an inter introductory class, it's easier to do the x and the y equations separately. So I, that's why I'm modeling it that way. Let's do it. Let's put this all together. Um, Ax, let's do this again. So I've got my Ax equals 1 over the mass times fx normal was 0 plus fx gravity minus mg sine theta. Okay, I can just, I can I immediately see those cancel. This is minus g sine theta. Similarly, ay 
is 1 over n times Fy sub n, I have up here the normal force, the full magnitude of the normal force, plus Fy sub g, that's a minus as well, minus mg cosine theta. And here, um, oh, I happen to know what Ay is. Ay is 0 because my acceleration, I guess I could have written that down before, my acceleration doesn't have a y component. It's all along the x. That's what we did. So this just equals 0. I'll put it over there. And I can look at this. I can underline my unknowns. I don't know what a sub x is. I don't know what f sub n is. But because of my wise choice of tilted coordinates, I have one equation and one unknown here and one equation and one unknown there. If I had done any other choice of coordinates, I had something that wasn't tilted to match the exact story, then if I had done some other thing, the traditional ones or some other tilt, I would have found that I'd have both AX and FN, both the magnitude of acceleration and the normal force and the magnitude of acceleration and the normal force in both equations, and I'd have two equations and two unknowns that I needed to solve in some complicated way. It would still work, but it would be a pain. So I've got this, and at this point, I can solve for each one of these results. I can solve to find, well, I, AX equals minus G sine theta. I may as well write it down. AX equals minus 9.80 meters per second squared times the sine of 10 degrees. And uh, I don't know if I even ever wrote down the answer for that. Uh, it's going to be relatively small. And I'm, I can also write down that the normal force is, this is where I actually have a mass left over. Here I have my, I said the mass was 5 kilograms here, so 5 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times the cosine of 10 degrees. There I have answers. I can find the answers for the acceleration and the normal force. Again, notice the fascinating thing, the acceleration, the mass has canceled out. In fact, let me even think about that for a second. This is a good point where I've got symbolic results showing up here. It's a good point to take stock of where we are and to see if this is making sense. When I look at this, let me check my answers. Let us, let's say my slope was not at 10 degrees. Let's say it was 90 degrees. It's actually just falling straight down. What would my acceleration be? Well, the sine of 90 degrees is 1. My acceleration down the slope would be negative g. It would be if, if x, if I tilted all the way, x would be up and my acceleration would be negative g, that's free fall. That makes sense. If the slope were 0 degrees, if it were flat, I'd have sine of 0 degrees is 0. So ax equals minus g. That's you know, a minus g times 0. ax is 0. For a flat thing, gravity is not going to pull me along the slope. It's flat. It's not moving. Similarly, over here, the normal force, you can see if I was at 90 degrees, just free fall, Cosine of 90 is 0, the normal force is 0. It's not really touching the slope if it's falling straight down next to the slope. And similarly, if it were flat, if theta were, if theta were uh, 0 degrees, cosine of 0 is 1, the normal force is mg, it balances gravity perfectly. So those limits are all pretty sensible for me. These specific numbers, I suppose I should probably just whip out a calculator and figure out what they are, but I feel uninspired about doing that right away. I'd rather keep things symbolic as long as I can. I just want to show you we can get to the answers. The last step in our strategy, this is, this is everything we need to do for just you know, solving for accelerations and forces, but a lot of times my question is, as in this case, how fast are we going when we hit the tree? It's something about kinematics, motion. So step four in our problem solving strategy for forces is, if the question asks for it, solve the motion problem. that comes out of it, now that we know the acceleration. So this often this is called kinematics, if you want the official term. Solve the motion problem. Again, if there is a kinematics problem, like how fast is it going, this is what we want to know. How am I going to do this? Well, what do I do? Uh, this is a constant acceleration. I may not have calculated the number, but I know it's constant. And so I can set up a kinematics problem, a, con a, mo a constant acceleration problem, the way we typically do. This is my initial point where the sled is released from rest. This is my final point where it crashes headlong into the tree. And I can set things up. If this is my initial point, I can say that my initial time is zero seconds, my x initial is zero meters, 
my Vx initial is zero meters per second. And down here, when I hit the tree, I'll call that my final time. I don't know my final time. I know that x final is, think about my coordinates with x going uphill. I have to be consistent with that. So this is 10 meters. My x final must be positioned negative 10 meters. My vx final, I don't know. And that is my ultimate goal to answer the original question, to know how fast this sled's going to hit the tree. I, that's what I want to solve for. So I've got those things, and then, as usual with constant acceleration problems, I can write down my constant acceleration equations. This is probably old hat by now, but I can go ahead and do it. I've got Vx final equals Vx initial plus Ax times T final minus T initial. I've got X final equals X initial plus Vx initial times T final minus T initial plus one half AX T final minus T initial squared. And the third equation I usually write down is the V squared one. Vx final squared equals Vx initial squared plus two AX times X final minus X initial. And apparently I didn't quite erase that enough. Okay, I've got three equations written down. Let me see what goes into them. Uh, I plug in zeros into my equations as usual. So my initial time is zero. My initial position is zero. Zeros, zeros. My initial velocity was also zero. So I should get rid of that. Oh, that whole term is zero. Initial velocity is zero. Initial position is zero. Cool, I've plugged in zeros. I can underline unknowns. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, before I underline unknowns, I'm going to copy this down. Uh, I'll erase this step. I hate to, I could erase my free body diagram at this point, but I love my free body diagram so much I'm going to leave it there. Uh, copying this down, I know Vx final equals zero plus Ax t final. I know x final equals zero plus zero times whatever plus one half Ax t final squared. And I know Vx final squared equals 0 plus 2ax, and then uh, x initial is 0, so x final. That's my three equations. Let me now, again, I like to underline unknowns and equations just to sort of keep track of where I am. And my unknowns here are t final and vx final. So vx final, t final, t final, vx final. There we go. I have these three equations. I want to find. I'm looking for how fast we're going when the sled hits the tree. Well, you can always find a solution using the first two equations by combining them the right way. I could find time for the second one and plug it in here to find Vx final. But this one is going to be the fastest way to get this. I have it right there. So I'll use this equation. I'll say that I'll use this equation and just say that Vx final equals the square root of 2 times Ax over here was minus g sine theta times x final. And anytime I can take a square root in physics, I have to write plus or minus in front of it. Uh, so I've got that. I can plug in numbers. This is plus or minus the square root of 2 times minus 9.80 meters per second squared times the sine of 10 degrees times negative 10 meters. Okay, there's that. Uh, looking at this, there are things that make me happy. My negative signs here and here cancel out, so I get a positive under the square root. That means I don't have an imaginary answer, thank goodness. And looking at it, uh, I notice that I have meters times meters over second squared, meter squared over second squared, so I know that my final number is going to be in meters per second. This I can just plug into a calculator, and that I actually did do in advance. That's where it comes out to be, uh, well, underneath it's 34 meters squared per second squared, so I get about 5.8 meters per second. I still have to choose plus or minus sign, and well, my plus x direction is up the hill, I'm going to be moving down the hill, so this must be the minus 5.8 meters per second.
There's my final answer to this whole problem, is that minus 5.8 meters per second. So let me just remind you of what we just did and what we've just seen. We had our, we got the answer, it feels good. I did some double checks, some reasonableness double checks in the middle of the whole calculation. Let me run through what the steps were. Step one was to identify forces, which involved drawing a picture, dotted line around your system. Step two was to draw the free body diagram. Always, always draw the free body diagram. Then step three, every single time you draw a free body diagram, the whole point of doing it was to use and write down Newton's second law. Every time you draw a free body diagram, pretty much, that is exactly what you're setting yourself up to do. And then, in this case, since there was a motion part attached to it, the fourth step is usual motion problem, kinematics stuff. Now that we know the acceleration, or now that we've identified information about the acceleration from Newton's second law. So those are the steps. That's how we solve every force problem ever in physics, pretty much. Uh, sometimes you need to have more than one system at a time and talk about interactions using Newton's third law, but the basic idea is always the same. These four steps, they'll carry you through.